Thank you all for being here tonight. We are so excited to have Lauren Lieberman share a wealth of knowledge for those of us who are considering or interested in starting your own camp abilities. So please um, enjoy and learn and take lots of notes from Lauren Lieberman. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for being so calm. I know it's a stressful night. So we're glad that we're, everybody's here. And so I know that a lot of you already run camps. Some of you already run camps. And some of you have been to some of the camp abilities around the, the world. And, you know, for me, this session is one hour and I've been doing this for 28 years and trying to figure out what exactly I wanted to share with you was, was really hard to do because there's so much I want to share. I'm going to try to streamline it to what do you need to know about how I started the process, the options, and then what I'm going to suggest for you. So this, I'm Lauren Lieberman. I, I'm a distinguished service professor at SUNY Brockport, and this will be our 28th year of Camp Abilities Brockport and our 26th year face-to-face, -face, as you know. And so Camp Abilities is actually part of our Institute of Movement Studies for Individuals with Visual Impairments. And some of you have heard me talk about this before, but we focus on programming, on leadership with our undergraduate and graduate students, on education and workshops just like this one. And we focus a lot on research. We use a lot of our camps to gather important data to learn about the needs of kids with visual impairments so we can help more kids. And this picture is actually of camp abilities in Bangladesh where the kids were being creative because they didn't have hockey sticks or uh, brooms. They didn't have brooms, so they use these they are quick cricket wickets. So that was a, a eye-opening thing. So this is our website for our institute. If anybody's interested, we have our video about our institute on there and some of our goals and objectives and some of the things that we do on there. Okay. And so just to let you know, camp abilities, it, it, it's not just a local thing or not just in the US. In 2018, I applied for a global Fulbright scholarship with the US government. And the government actually gave me a, a Fulbright scholarship to go around the world and help people start camp abilities. So we already had several international camps around the world. And luckily now we have more camps in Ghana, South Africa and Ireland and Brazil. And we just had a new camp in Camp Abilities Kenya last summer. And then January, we're gonna go back to Kenya and do another camp. And I just also came back from uh, Switzerland, Camp Ability Switzerland was really awesome. Took some students there for that one. And so just before we, we go on, I do wanna show you a little video of, of, on our 20th anniversary, we made a really cool video. And by the way, this is from our website, campabilities.org. And this is one of our videos that we made on the 20th anniversary of camps all over the world. Just a little bit about our camps. Camp Abilities is an overnight educational sports camp for children of visual impairments, blindness, and deaf blindness. And the reason why we need a Camp Abilities is because so many kids are not provided an opportunity to do sports and physical activity and recreation in their hometowns and in their schools. Yeah, I was a big sports fan, and I got to do these sort of things because of camp abilities. I never thought my wildest dreams that blind people and sports, you know, went together before camp abilities. Being here, you have your friends, you have people that you don't know, people that you do know, and it helps you to really open up. Here, everybody is like you, and here, everybody has that shell, and it's up to you to open up from that shell and to really communicate and to really give in to everything. The purpose of camp is to give those kids experience in sports and physical activity and different recreation activities and understand how to make them accessible for themselves. Just because you're blind or just because you're deaf doesn't mean that you, don't, you cannot do anything. They can do exercise, they can swim, they can do you know they can like you know they can fight from themselves and we also teach the kids how to advocate when they are in a situation where they know that they can access a sport how to access that and how to teach the teachers how to teach them and make them included 
And so camp is for the kids with visual impairments. And it's also to train the teachers about how to teach kids with visual impairments. The joy that I've had from seeing, seeing all of the kids, being able to do something that they've never thought was possible, improve something, watch them socialize. To me, there's no greater joy. And so it takes every ounce of energy I got, and I honestly don't really sleep, but it's the it's what I need to recharge me for every single year for my teaching for everything that I do. It's it's I'm just I'm hooked. I'm hooked on camp and the people that have been hooked kind of know it's the kids. It's all about the kids. Camp abilities originally started at State University of New York College of Rockport in 1996. And some people from Alaska were there. They came to the Brockport camp and said, wow, this is a great concept. We don't have anything for people with visual impairment in terms of sports. Would you come to Alaska and start camp there? And that became the beginning of the expansion of camp abilities. Camp have been involved with camp abilities for so many years. It, to me, has always been our vision that all of us graduate students or people that have been involved in camp or have the passion for camp should start one wherever they're at. This is not a business. It's not a franchise. It's a group of dedicated and committed colleagues who decided that children with blindness and visual impairments did not have the opportunities that many other children have and not as many opportunities as um, some other disability groups have. Camp Ability actually makes me feel very included because I'm not the only blind person here. I feel like I'm well of a slim family and it makes me feel really happy and excited. I've been at Camp Abilities for 10 years now. This is my 10th year. So That's a showdown. Day. I think Camp Abilities really helped me because I realized when going to Camp Abilities that I can do all these different sports and even if they do have to be modified a little bit I still can do this but with anticipation and expectation and bars soaring higher and higher throughout the week that you just feel you feel it in the air and it's it's contagious the energy the positivity the supportiveness the encouragement it's all contagious the money to support capabilities all comes from donations. It's a huge community effort. This year we started something where we said it, they wanted to sponsor a camper. We figured out how much it costs per camper and put that out there. That was a huge help for us. I grew up doing sports and I felt like it was a huge part of my life. And when I look at a lot of the kids with visual impairments that are growing up in society today, and I think about there's an athlete in that body they deserve the same rights that we have, that, that kids who are sighted and hearing have. And they really don't have the same kind of quality of life that their peers have. And I think that everybody deserves to be involved in sports and physical activity because we can learn a lot from the contribution of people who are blind and vision. The parents are proud of them. They're proud of themselves. We're proud of them. And I think all over again, I really picked the right thing to do. So this video is on our Camp Abilities website on the front page, and you'll see on the front page our brochure for this year and our dates. I'm inviting everybody right now, come to Brockport if you'd like. If you want to see our camp before you start yours, I understand that. If you want to start a small camp this year and, and then come to our camp and then go bigger the next year, that, that's fine too. But I also want to share that under the media tab, is the Campabilities Startup Manual and the templates right here. And then here's the newsletters from 2006 on about what the kids did every day at camp. We have great records. And then we have under instructional materials, we have tons of books and, and assessments and webs, just there's a ton of information, tip sheets in there. You can share that with the people that you work with and, and, and teachers and parents as well. And then also under Lavelle resources is lots of tip sheets, assessments, and a video on how do you teach kids with visual impairments and additional disabilities. So lots of stuff on this website, but again, there's also several videos 
about camp abilities. And you'll see this is our HBO. The first time we were on HBO Real Sports, this is our HBO Real Sports segment. But it's hard. It was hard to decide which one to show you. But I think that one kind of gave you a global overview of camp abilities. But so what is camp abilities? And I know that some of you might know about camp abilities. Some of you might know about the sports education camps that stemmed out of out of Western Michigan with Paul and Sue Panchilia. That is actually what I modeled camp abilities after. And we start ours a little bit lower. Like a lot of our kids didn't come from schools for the blind. They never even played a lot of these sports before. And so this is a picture of our camp abilities. Brockport, we, are, we color code the kids because each of them are in their little pod or their team with other kids their same age. And they just go around in smaller groups because it's a very big camp that we have here with just amazing, amazing specialists. And, and, and I have great graduate students as well. So, so our camp is one week. We go, from, we, go from, we go from Sunday to the next Saturday. And we stay in the dorms at, at SUNY Brockport. And so basically our camps from kids who are nine to 19 who are visually impaired, blind, or deafblind. And our camps are set up to provide one-to-one -one or two-to-one -to -one instruction for each person because kids with visual impairments learn more if you, if you have more opportunities to teach and give instruction and feedback, instruction, feedback, instruction, feedback. That's when they're going to improve. And what we do during that week is we teach the kids how to reach their full potential in sports and in life. But we also, a big part of our program has become self-advocacy. And I'll talk more about the self-advocacy program as well. So our missions, we have several missions, of course, to empower kids with visual impairments in sport. We wanna educate future teachers. So we literally have coaches and counselors come from all over the world to learn how to teach kids with visual impairment because you can't learn how to teach kids with visual impairment in sports in a book or in a video or in one goal ball simulation, you have to do it. And also because we have so many kids from so many, so from, from so, so far away, so many different ages, levels of vision, gender. And so we do a lot of research, but we use our research that we do at camp to help other kids with visual impairments, okay? And then be, of course, for a whole week, of, uh, of camp, it's, it is a nice respite for the parents. Some of the parents drop their kids off and go to Niagara Falls. They go to the Finger Lakes or they just like take a little break uh, from being home with their one of their kids. And then also we try to get the kids out into the community. So by teaching kids like this picture is one of our athletes who's doing a girls on the run 5K. By her being out in the community, running a 5K among her peers with the public, we are changing people's perceptions of what it means to be blind. So by getting our athletes on their swim team, on their track team, on their cross country, we have kids out in the community competing with their peers. And where we live, where all of our athletes are out in the community, people expect to see kids with visual impairments on sports teams. They're not surprised. It's not on the news anymore. It is an expectation. And you can make that happen too if it's not happening where you live. So these are our missions for camp abilities. And I'm just gonna ask you if you have any questions or if I say an acronym or a sport or if I'm going too fast, please put it in the chat. And I'm gonna ask Melissa if you would please monitor the chat for me. So then if people have a question that I might not see it, but if you could just tell me that, that would yep, be great. Absolutely, you got it. Thanks, Melissa. No and so we started our camp in 1996, we had 27 campers and we just started out with beat baseball, goal ball, gymnastics, swimming, track and field and archery. Oh, and we had, we did have tandem biking, but we only had a few bikes because we had to borrow them. So I don't even have that on here. So, and then in 2020, we've gone all the way up to 20 camps in 10 countries. And unfortunately COVID kind of, kind of put some of those camps on pause, but I, I'll talk a little bit more about the, our future here. And then if anybody's interested in the most recent HBO special that we had, this is the link and that this, this slide is on the PowerPoints that Melissa sent you. And you just have to put in the password, real sports. They didn't make this one public on YouTube like they did the last one, but you can get onto the new HBO real sports one on this link. And I'm really excited to share that 
along this journey, I, I wrote a book about camp abilities and how I started camp and the evolution of camp and, and my experience at all the camps, Bangladesh to Finland to the Maryland camp abilities, Florida. I mean, it's just been an incredible journey. This is coming out in February. And uh, I hope you'll you'll read it because it's really, I think it's inspiring. And we have an entire Camp Abilities family out there. We help each other on our journey to help ch kid, kids with visual impairments. And uh, and this is the book about it. So it's going to be through SUNY Press. And this uh, athlete on the cover here, Andrew, is now on the U.S. blind ice hockey team. And he has a tournament this coming weekend in Indiana. I think it's in Indiana. Yeah, and we have another athlete, Max Shearer. Max is also on the U.S. blind ice hockey team. So, you know, lots of exciting things to share with our athletes' successes. So even if your state has a camp, don't hesitate to start a new camp. So in, in New York, we have five camps. But I still run into kids who haven't had the opportunity to do sports in New York State. So we have our camp here. We have Camp Badger down in Spencer, New York, near Ithaca. We have camp in Utica. We have Utica, New York through Cabby. We have our Saratoga camp abilities with, uh, with Tiffany Supas. And then we have our Long Island camp abilities. So exciting to have, uh, have so many camps in New York, but we could even still use some more camps in New York. But luckily we also have camps all over the country. Some states already have two camps and uh, we're growing. And, and I know some of the people that are here are considering starting a camp. I will do anything I can to help everybody start a camp. We have an amazing team of people. If you say, I want two or three specialists to come to my camp and help me start, you got it. We'll put the call out. Our Camp Abilities family is on it. And then we have Camp Abilities all over the world. Like I said, I mean, I've been so fortunate to be able to go to some camps in, in other countries and, and really see some inspiring dedicated people and and you know in different cultures and especially cultures like in Ghana and in Bangladesh where people with visual impairments are looked down on and they're really changing the perceptions of what people think about people who are visually impaired so very exciting times so in our camps across the world these are some of the sports that we offer and again this is not exhaustive if you look around your community it has to be culturally relevant. The kids need to learn the sports that kids are doing nearby them. Like disc golf is getting really big where we live. So I got a grant. We built a disc golf course on campus. That wasn't that easy, but we did. And now we also have disc golf because that's really growing. So what's important? What's near you? And I started off thinking, what are after school sports in our community? And what are Paralympic sports? Let's offer those first. So we have track and field, swimming, beep kickball. Thank you to Judy Bird, by the way. Judy Bird is a godsend. She is our guiding light for camp abilities. I'll talk about more about her later, but she invented the beep kickball. All our camps, we play beep kickball as a kind of a stepping stone to be, to be baseball or not. A lot of kids just love beep kickball. We do tandem cycling, judo, Paralympic sport. Our athletes love stand-up paddleboarding. We'll, we'll ride on the canal, so it's pretty easy to do that. We play beat baseball. Many of our athletes have gone on to play in their local beat baseball teams. Goalball, of course, gymnastics, cricket, or is blind cricket, kayaking, fishing, basketball, rollerblading. We play showdown. That was that game in the video that looked like, looked like air hockey. Soccer or football, now it's called blind soccer. Big, big push for blind soccer in the U.S., because we're creating a team in the US where we haven't had one before. We do rock climbing and we do high ropes course, archery. We do sailing on, the, on Lake Ontario. And then some, some of our camps do cycling indoors. We also teach them kids how to use the indoor fitness, fitness centers. And, and the list goes on. And as sports become more popular, like we just added cornhole with the Camp Abilities logo on it. Thank you, it's very exciting. Uh, we also have a seven person bike. I, if you get a chance to get that, I would encourage that. So, and it's not just a sports camp. You think about it. We're on a college campus. Our athletes live in dorms with other kids with visual impairments. They go to the swimming pool on a college campus. They go to the cafeteria with their tray. We work on every component of the expanded core curriculum. 
If anybody wants to know exactly how we wrote an article about it in one of our studies, I can share that with you. But in every camp abilities, kids are kind of guided out of their comfort zone to take on more independence, to take on more mobility, independent living skills, and try sports to an extent that they've never done it before. Some of the athletes come here with an idea of somebody told them they can't do ball sports, or they learned basketball in a way that wasn't conducive for them, or they got hurt and they don't like it. And I say, try the camp abilities way because we're gonna set it up in a safe way that's more conducive for you. And oftentimes they're like, I never knew I could like this, or I never knew I could do ball sports. And, and our ECC instruction is, it's authentic. It's real life. They go to the cafeteria. They're actually in a talent show. There, there's so many things that happen. I, they, they get a QR code in the fitness center. Then on their phone, they can have actually be talked through a piece of, of fitness equipment. And they're allowed to ask questions. They're allowed to make mistakes and take risks. And that's what Camp Abilities is all about. And there's a lot of unique features of Camp Abilities. And again, you make it your own. Uh, we do have the copyright on Camp Abilities, but if it's a sports camp, primarily for kids with visual impairments, you have a one-to-one, -one, it's educationally based. You can have your own Camp Abilities. We assess all the sports so the kids actually achieve. They're not just going through the motions. We're not a camp where we're just kind of going through the motions. It's not participation, it's achievement. Every athlete has a modification checklist that they check off what modifications they used, what they liked. They take that home so when they need to self-advocate, they can actually look at that modifications checklist or share it with their teacher or their coach so they know exactly what they need to be successful in that sport. We've had a lot of success with our modification checklist. The modification checklist is part of our self-advocacy program. We have been doing self-advocacy for years and years, and we're making it a lot more formal now. We're getting more grant money and support. We now have a self-advocacy playbook that's free. It's a free download under instructional materials on our website. We made a self-advocacy video that talks about the four components of self-advocacy and the five steps to self-advocacy. There's also, uh, in, the, in the playbook, there's also like worksheets that help kids go, get through what they want to self-advocate for and how do they get that. And so that's a big unique feature of Camp Abilities. Every single Camp, camp Abilities has the rights to all of our self-advocacy materials and we're gonna make sure we give it to you freely and we're working more on the self-advocacy program and, and it's just gonna be growing and growing. Along with that, we have the, a care to share program where at breakfast and at dinner, the athletes stand up and they say what they're proud of, something that they've never done before. And that's called care to share. It's awesome. All the Lions Clubs that come to camp and they, the Lions Clubs, they share their, they, they, the Lions Clubs bring our meals and then they'll stay and listen to what the kids were proud of, what they did that day that they never did before. We take their voice and that's what we put in our newsletter so the parents can actually read about what all the kids have been doing all week. And then also the, the coolest thing too is that the athletes as young as, you know, some of the camps have kids as young as seven or eight years old, they get to meet Paralympians. They get to meet elite athletes and they get to realize that, hey, he has a visual impairment too. And he got to go to Tokyo. How cool is that? I could probably do that too. And our athletes, like I said, have gone on to compete nationally and internationally. So again, a lot of this information is under in Camp Abilities under instructional materials. There's also free books, free downloads of books on there as well. Okay, so our assessments, we assess in so many of our sports, swimming, gymnastics, goal ball, beat baseball, tandem biking, track and field. We have assessments for other sports as well. We also have an orientation mobility checklist. We're actually focusing on orientation mobility this summer more than we have before. We have an ECC checklist that we created. We look at level of independence and we're right now we're validating a self-advocacy questionnaire that follows the four components of self-advocacy. And we're validating that. So when you do your camp, you could use that self-advocacy questionnaire before and after and see if you've really helped them 
feel better about self-advocacy. And this picture is of one of our coaches teaching one of our athletes physically assisting him how to do the breaststroke. And by the way, we also do an orientation, a full day, a day and a half orientation before the kids get there with our coaches. So they feel totally comfortable. They get to do all the sports with a blindfold on so that they have an idea what the kids are going through and how to teach them. So they, they come, no matter if they come from the vision field, they come from special ed, physical education, whatever their background is, they, they, they're all on the same page when the kids get there. Okay. We have been so fortunate in our, in our Paralympic journey to, to bring in some amazing Paralympians. We've brought in everyone from Trisha Zorn, who's the most decorated Olympian or Paralympian, who's a swimmer, Marla Runyon in track and field, Jim Mastro in judo, and, and the list goes on. We have some of you, a lot of you probably know Jennifer Armbruster from Goalball. A lot of these are medal winners. Uh, and Martha Ruther is our own, one of our own former campers who is a two-time Paralympian for swimming. And, uh, and Lindsay Ball was one of our graduate students and she's a skier, now an elite runner. And uh, this picture, the top one is of, of, of Trisha Zorn and then the bottom one is of Andy Jenks. And so one of the most exciting things we just did this past summer, it was our 25th year face-to-face. -face, so we did a 25 hour and 15 minute goalball marathon. We beat the Guinness Book of World Record, but we didn't really do it. We didn't do it officially, but we brought in the Paralympians, Tyler Marin, Callahan Young and Mindy Cook. I, I dreamed big and I got a, a grant just to do the goalball marathon. And uh, it was really epic. We brought back some of our former graduate students to, to work the goalball marathon. This is a picture of, this is Callahan Young, the, tall, the tallest person in the middle. Tyler Marin is on his right, and then Mindy Cook is here on the left. Those are our Paralympians. We have uh, Jalen, one of our undergrads. This is Andrew, our uh, the, the athlete that was on the cover of the book on the US Blind Ice Hockey Team. And this is my former graduate student, and this is Eric Tuttle, and he just got a job with the Northwest Association for Blind Athletes. So not only do we have camp abilities, but the graduate students that we train go on to perpetuate the field. So it's really great that the ripple effect that we see is just wonderful. Lauren, there was a question. Um, do uh -huh. you have specific information about archery? Um, this person looked online, but might be missing it. You mean like adaptations for archery? Um, I'm going to make that assumption. Yes. If that person will respond to that question. Yes. Yep. Actually. Yes. That's a good question. And if you tell me where I'll, I'll dig through your site too. No, actually that's a good question. We have this. So we've been doing a lot of outdoor adventure activities. And so we've been doing some presentations and it's in a presentation, but I actually hadn't put it on the website yet. So let me make sure that I put the outdoor. So, so we have an outdoor adventure video series that's on our website, but we don't have archery in that video series. We have a, a lot of other outdoor adventure activities in there, but it's in a PowerPoint that we did. But I mean, I can also help if you want to, if you want to uh, adapt archery, I'm sure some of the other people on this call can as well. But we can also make sure we add that outdoor adventure presentation that has the archery on it to our resources. But I, and I haven't done that yet, so we will do that. Thank you. Good question. The response is that would be great. Okay, thank you. Thanks for thinking of that because I it, that would be a good thing to do. And so this is exciting news that we just finished this this book called Infusing Self-Advocacy into Physical Education and Health Education. It's literally coming out next week. And so it's through Shape America. And so if you are interested, you can look in Shape America and look under their publications and you can order it from there. But it literally goes through what is self-advocacy, what are the components, and there's lots of lesson plans in there. And it also has a lot on health, nutrition, hygiene, all those kind of things. And I didn't realize before I wrote this book that there's nothing out there for even for kids who are able-bodied, sighted kids, there's nothing out there to teach self-advocacy. There's all this curriculum on self-determination, but you cannot be self-determined if you don't have self-advocacy skills. 
So this is a book you can get, but, for, but again, like I said, for free on our website is the self-advocacy playbook that's specific to kids with visual impairment and our self-advocacy video, which is also specific to kids with visual impairments. And it's like right from, right from their perspective. So uh, I just wanted to share some information about our self-advocacy program. And then one of the beauties of camp too, I, I'm just really proud to say we've worked hand in hand for years and years with the American Printing House for the Blind. I know Tristan is on this call. She has been so dedicated to camp. And so over the past 20 years, we've partnered with APH so many ways. I mean, we're doing this webinar with APH, of course. I mean, there's so many things that were tied together, but we've created a lot of these products. I know some of these products, I just saw that some of them are not, or they've been discontinued, which I, I didn't know until recently. And so, but the sound balls are still there. The walk run for fitness kit is still there. Uh, the books are now all free downloads, which is really exciting. And uh, and I can I look forward to continuing our partnership with APH. And one one thing that I know any day it'll come out. This is called Sport Courts, and we help a lot of our different people from different camps put our head together when we propose this to APH. But it's going to be available. It has. 13 tactile sport courts with magnetized braille, 13 mini courts are gonna be in, and, and they're all gonna be tactile with braille with, so you can teach the kids during pre-teaching, you can use this, these tactile boards. And so the kids have an idea of what the sport is before they get out there. So this is tennis. There's two little people on the court, but again, it's raised. It says less, left service court, right service court, back court, and that's all in braille. And it, it's really gonna revolutionize the way people teach physical education with kids with visual impairments. I'm so excited. And I'm not sure exactly when it'll come out, but hopefully soon. And, and just a little aside, if you had to do a virtual camp, we have kind of mastered it at this point because we had to do it for, for so many times. And so we did two virtual camps and then one semester, we did a literally an entire semester long individual program, a virtual program. And so we also, the nice thing about the virtual camp is that we got to zoom in Paralympic athletes from all over the country, which was great. And so we we sent these, it was called Camp Abilities in a Bag. It had yoga mat, bell basketball, small little goal balls, and it had so a soccer ball, a bell soccer ball, tethers, a guide wire, and we had a water bottle and t-shirt and just, it had therabands, jump ropes. It was just like an entire camp in a bag. It was really fun. I mean, it was fun having face to face is better, but it was fun at least to be able to do that. Okay. Lauren, there's a comment that when the supply chain gets back to normal, there's hopes that the rope for uh, the jump rope for fitness is back up and running. Oh, okay, good. I hope so too. Cause I know that was pretty popular. Thank you, Tristan. So again, I just show, kind of showed you, this is where I'm going to start saying, okay, I'm just going to just kind of share how I've helped some other people start camp abilities. But I used to just send out like, here's, here's this and here's that. So we put it all into this book and it's called the Camp Abilities Startup Manual. It's really organized. If you have to justify the camp, there's grants in there. There's just such a step-by-step, -step. there's timelines in there, there's sample letters. So between the manual and the templates, you can actually change them to, to your own needs, put your own logo or put your own like letterhead on the top. But if there's anything that's not in there, I mean, I'd be happy to talk through, through it on the phone. And, uh, and I've even like come out and help people start their camps the first time they've had it. If I, if I have time, I, I love to do that. It's just exciting to be there. Lauren, there's a question. Um, do you have any additional resources where to get the beep baseball bases? I, I really don't know where to get the bases. I, I do think that Flag House has a kit. It's really expensive and the bases are not that good, but I don't know where else to get the bases. I, I've been telling people to use those kind of blow up kind of, you know, there's sand in the bottom and, and, and it's like, it looks like a superhero and it kind of, it, it kind of, it kind of flips up because there's sand in the bottom. Use that with a beeper or, or with somebody like clapping because they're really hard to get and they're expensive, but 
but you could get you could get them through flag house i think it is okay so the keep keep asking questions don't be afraid to ask questions so how do you start a camp abilities this is an awesome picture Erin Chino, one of our star coaches, is, is with one of our athletes who's deaf blind, working hand over hand with her on the stand up paddleboard to show her how to stand up paddleboard. The first thing you have to do is find a date and a place. Everything else can fall into place because you don't know what meals you're going to need unless you have a date and a place. You don't know what sports you're going to offer until you know where you're going to have it. But then you can set, you can recruit your team and say, we're going to have it from these days at this place. Who can come and help me? These are the sports we're going to have. And then also you, I, I encourage people to charge a fee. I know there's some, some organizations that have transition funding and you don't really have to charge a fee. I understand that, but I think that families take it more seriously if you do charge something. The other thing is it's such a burden to do the fundraising if you have to do the fundraising. It takes a lot of the burden off you. The first two years, I only charged $250 for a whole week of camp. And every year we were in the red and I had to raise $5,000 before I even started fundraising for the next year until I increased the fee. And so we're lucky now that our New York State Commission for the Blind pays the registration fee for all the kids from New York. They, we only have to pay for kids from outside New York or, or, or if they are older. I don't know. Sometimes New York State's funny. They think if you're 14, you have to start working. So if you're over 14, they a lot of the kids, they make them pay too. But okay. So you find your date and location. Okay. And so some of the places that people have had camps are at Lions Camps. A lot of states, like we have Camp Badger, we have a camp abilities there. I know in Maryland, they have the camp at, at, a, at, a, at a Lions Camp. Universities are great places. They're, they're just, the facilities are terrific. The red tape can sometimes be overwhelming. But after the first time that you do it, it gets easier and easier. I think the easiest place usually to have it is a school for the blind because they totally understand everything. And, and, and everything's usually already accessible. They already have connections to people. I mean, when we were in the Missouri School for the Blind, it was amazing because they had connections to the people in the community that had a beat baseball team, the goalball, judo players. I mean, and everybody knew where the school was and the school had a good I had a good track record. Church camps, we our CAVV camp is held at a church camp. It's really nice. And oftentimes they are accessible. And any other place that you feel might be conducive to hosting a sports camp there. And again, if you have certain sports that you really, really want, you just have to make sure that you can have that there. Now, when we were in our Alaska camp at this church camp on a lake, we couldn't do track and field or swimming or, or tandem biking there. So we took a van and we went to a school, a high school every day. And that wasn't too bad either. It was like a 10 minute ride. The kids made up the songs on the way. And then we'd go back every night and then the kids did the canoeing and they did the swimming in the lake too. So, you know, it, it depends on, on, on what, you're, what you're looking for and what's, what's conducive to where you live. And again, I, I am, I'm not one to say, you do not have to have a week long camp of 55 kids. That is, we worked up to that and sometimes I, I wish I didn't, but one day camps are very powerful. I, I, I'm not gonna ever poo poo a one day camp. You could expand it, but having a one day camp ensures that you, you should be successful. You get the pictures, the kids don't get too tired and then you don't have to really worry about the dorms. You could have a long weekend camp. That's what a lot of our camps do. They go from like Friday to Monday or Thursday night to Monday. And that works out pretty well, having a weekend camp. A week long camp is terrific. You really get to bond. And the nice thing is you get to do sports over and over. So you really do get to see your achievement. And I know some people run, they call them like a taster camp where you might have a, a camp for a week, but then you're just like letting kids dibble and dabble and you don't do anything again. So there's something to say about a taster camp. You're trying a lot of different sports. and being able to do sports again and again gives kids the sense of, of accomplishment. So I know in our Pennsylvania camp at Westchester University, 
theirs is a weekend camp, but some of the kids actually choose a specialty and they do it over and over. And then at the end of the camp, they actually do a triathlon, which is really cool. You decide. Some people actually, I know at, in, in, uh, in Utica, they were also doing every, every month they did a different sport and they did it on a Saturday. So you can decide what kind of camp abilities you want to run that's suitable to your lifestyle and your organization. Lauren, and there's a question. Um, sure. Who holds the liability insurance for the camp? And then I've got one more after that. Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Each camp is their own entity. So if at our camp, it, we're, we are funded through the Research Foundation. So our, our insurance is through the Research Foundation. You would have to find your own like uh, umbrella. So if you're 20, a 501c3, oftentimes wh wherever you go, they can help support your insurance. There are also insurance companies and you say, this camp is this long, these are the sports we're doing. And they might charge you, you know, four dollars a day per child or something for insurance. There are a lot of sports camp insurance companies. Sometimes the, you know, if you do things like rock climbing or high ropes, it might be a little more expensive. But if you can afford it, don't shy away from those because those are very powerful. Okay, good question. Nope. And the next one, um, I think this is probably something that you may already have going, um, but starting a contact list of some sort. So people who are interested in starting a camp in the same city town can collaborate and possibly work together. Great idea. Yes. Yeah, so on our Camp Abilities website, there's other, it's under other camps, and there's a whole list of the camps all over the world and who to contact. I don't have any other questions, but I will put that in the chat for you. Awesome. Thank you. So, so again, you know, you have to choose the sports that are conducive to have wherever you are. Like some places, it's not conducive for tandem biking. Like in the Switzerland camp, you really, we couldn't really ride the tandem bikes. She did have tandem bikes, we couldn't really do it. So like what, what kind of facilities, what are the fields like? What's the pool like? What's the track like? And, and when is it available? Can you use those facilities? And so you just have to think about what do you wanna do? What are the facilities? And then also, where can you get that equipment, okay? So, so those are some things you have to think about. We borrowed a lot of equipment at the beginning and we slowly just bought it as we went along. And actually now we're at the point where if anybody needs a tandem bike, we can probably give a couple of our tandem bikes away to some camps who need them as well. So then this is a big question, funding and specialist. Where do you get money and where do you get your specialists? So basically there's two types of professionals that are, there's more than that, but just we have, each sport is run by a sport specialist. So when the group gets there, the children are with their one-to-one -one coach, but there's someone with a specialty in, let's say gymnastics or goal ball or track and field that's there, that's running that, that's running that event or that, that sport. And so funding, you can, like I said, charge a fee to the campers. Parents pay for their, their sighted kids to go to camps. There's, there's no reason why they shouldn't pay some, something for their kids with visual impairments to go to camp. You can write grants. Foundation grants are awesome. And it's not hard to convince people that kids with visual impairments need to play sports. <laughs> like, how much do you need? You know, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy to get grants, especially after you've done one camp. It's, the first time is a little harder. Fundraising, I mean, we have fundraisers, we ask people for donations, that, that works pretty well. We oftentimes too, like if you look at our website, it's, it has our wish list. So when a Lions Club wants to help us, they look at our wish list and they say, oh, you need a tent, here's a tent. Oh, you need a breakfast, here's a breakfast. You know, so you can get donations of specific things, which is easier for people than just to give money. Lions Clubs are amazing. I'm in my Lions Club. Last night, I think we approved $3,000 for different things, build a bed and this and that. But Lions Clubs focus on visual impairment. So it's, it's very likely that a lot, your local Lions Clubs or the Lions Clubs around you would support you, whether it's just money or if it's food, meals, transportation, equipment. Our clubs have been great. Again, borrowing equipment. I, we've, we've lent our equipment out to, to other camps before as well. And the other thing that you could do too is ask a local team, if you have a local beat baseball team, a goalball team, 
or soccer team, ask them to come and, and help you instruct. That way you can maybe save money on a specialist and they can bring some equipment as well. We had people come and help teach the stand-up paddleboard and they, you know, before we got our own stand-up paddleboards, they brought 20 stand-up paddleboards and taught that at camp. So those are just some ideas related to like some funding and some ways to get around having to have your own equipment. Because the other big issue is storage, right? If you don't have storage and you get all this equipment, what are you going to do with it? So we are actually at capacity on my campus. We've got two sheds on campus. We have two closets on campus. And I have a shed at my house in my backyard full of camp stuff. We, I have one shed just for camp stuff. So you have to think about storage before you get the big grant and get the equipment. Again, you could borrow equipment from other camps, local club teams. You could recruit specialists from other camps. If you know that there's another camp nearby you or even one of our camps, our specialists are keen on helping people. I know some of our specialists have gone like the entire summer from camp to camp to camp to camp. And uh, it's not a bad way to live your life. And then you can also recruit Paralymp Paralympians from your area. If you ask USABA, sometimes they'll get back to you and let you know like who might be in your area. You can also ask around at your local blind organizations and see if they know of any Paralympians that live near you. If you have enough funding, like we we flew in the Paralympians for our Paralympic goal, uh, for our for our 25 hour goal ball game, so you can recruit Paralympians and and pay for their transportation if you have that kind of support. I also feel strongly that it's important to give them something at least, you know, three or $500 or something like that. And then you can't have your camp without athletes and coaches. So basically we recruit from our, our, our coaches, we recruit from physical education programs, adapted physical education programs. We are really greatly connected with a lot of the T TBI, teachers of the visually impaired, orientation mobility specialist programs. They love giving their students real life, real world experiences, and they would encourage their students to come to our camps. We've had people here who are physical therapy students, and then other like school counseling, social work, uh, those kind of students. And actually, this year we uh, we had some incredible high school kids. I, I was really surprised at the maturity. Sometimes they're more mature than the college students. So you know, you get some high end students that are on sports teams from high schools and, and I wouldn't look down on that, you know, just making sure they're mature enough. And, and then re just related to athletes. So our commission for the blind in New York state has all of their children's consultants spread out around the state. And we give them, the, uh, we, we send them the link to our brochure, the dates, registration, and they spread the word. So the teachers of the visually impaired kind of hand pick kids who they think would work out well with camp abilities. Also, if you have a local school for the blind, they will share that with their students. We get a lot of our athletes from Batavia School for the Blind. We've had athletes from the New York Institute. If you have a state NFB, the state NFB will share the word. I mean, we, we directly align with NFB's mission, you know, to promote independence and to promote, promote quality of life and, and promote the ability to be an independent person. You, if you have a state AER, I always bring brochures to our state AER conference. Those are the teachers that are going to see the kids in the state that will send them to us. So, you know, there's there's a lot of easy ways to, to get the word out. I think the hardest thing is that sometimes if parents don't know you, they might be a little reluctant. So having the, the people from the state from the from AER saying this is a great program. The person that runs it is legit, and uh, and then you can go from there. But you know, and once once some kids come, they can also invite some of their friends, and it just snowballs. And and sometimes you have a waiting list. And I just encourage you if you if you do let kids come in from far away, if you start getting too big, don't turn kids away. Just tell the other states to start their own camp because that's what I had to do because. I was turning away kids from New York because I was letting in kids from other states. And then I said, you're going to have to start your own camp because we have to help our kids that are down the street. Lauren, there's a question. Um, okay. Is camp abilities appropriate for children with multiple disabilities, IDD and or wheelchair bound in addition to being blind, deaf? Great question. Blind. All right. So this is my rule of thumb. 
they have to be predominantly independent. They can't have a severe behavior disability and they can't really have any medical issues because we only have two nurses. They have to have communication enough that they can tell what they need. And so I know it's hard because I've had to turn kids away before, but I just know having that child at camp would be so hard for them and for us, it wouldn't be fun for anyone. But I have started to run programs just for kids with multiple disabilities. And then I have it very small, like eight kids. And those have been great because they come with their parents. So our student works one-to-one -one with the child and the parents are there and we teach the parents how to teach the kids. I have a, a big grant from the Lavelle Fund for the Vine right now. We had one last year and we did motor skills and we have one this year, we're doing aquatics. And there is not a lot out there for kids with visual impairment and additional disabilities. So it is hard to turn kids away, but if they don't have those qualities, if they're not independent or they have medical issues, it's, it's not safe. Like a behavior problem is gonna take more than a week to figure out. You can't do that in a week. And so that's why we, we kind of have a li limited. So I hope that answers the question. It does. And then there's a comment that vision rehab therapists are great resources. Yes, vision rehab therapists, great resources. They come to camp and, and they actually have been helping our kids learn how to be independent, use technology. Because in, in our common area, we have brailers, we have computers, and the kids get to get to try all these things with the VRTs helping. Thank you. So I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I do want to answer anybody's questions. I will stop sharing. Maybe people can uh, let us know like what other questions you have. Do you plan on starting a camp this summer? Contact them. So um, the question is regarding the contact list thing. Oh, okay. um, I was thinking, however, about those in the webinar tonight who are looking to start a camp ability and starting a contact list for this particular group. I saw multiple people from North Carolina, so I thought I would ask. Is there any way you could do that, Melissa? Like make like you know, these people and so people can look at what states people are from and then contact them. So what I can do is um I'll turn my I'll turn my video on so we can ha have this conversation. Um I can send if everyone is okay, I can send um Lauren you the registration list. Um and that way everyone can collaborate through that email rather than does that make sense? So you would send it to me and then I would send it out to everyone? Yeah. Okay. We can do that. And then, all right. So uh, Alex wants everyone to know Camp Abilities New Jersey at Field of Dreams coming to you for three days this August. Congratulations, Alex. I'm, I'm really excited about that. That's going to be awesome. And then there's the thank you so very much, Lauren, for sharing all of your experiences and resources. Of course, Chris, thank you for coming. We need more. We need more camps in Texas. Texas is bigger than New York and <laughs> Texas only has one camp. Not only it's a great camp, but it's in North Texas. I mean, yeah. it's uh, it would be great to have uh, more camps in Texas. Also, I saw somebody said that the all the all the resources uh, in the chat. Can you send that out to everyone too, Melissa? So I can um, copy the chat and put it in there. I will delete all the non-important chat stuff, and I can email that out. Yep. Okay. And I right. non important chat, meaning like where everybody's from. <laughs> okay, great. Bye. Well, we have a couple more minutes. Does anybody else don't be afraid to ask any questions because it's not there. Was I mean, it's not awkward. there are codes. I will give that here in a second when I stop recording. Thank you so much, Lauren. This has been wonderful. I will be in touch soon. Oh, I'll, I'll give my email too. So okay, we put your email in there as well. And while you're doing it, I just want to thank everybody for being here and Lauren sharing the years of experience that you have and being so open and willing to share all of your expertise. Sure. And Leah was saying, did did you give the link for the presentation yet with the presentation in it? I put it in there several times, so I'll do that here in a second. I just thought, 
I just want to let everybody know that I'm in the process of writing a grant to give grants to new camps, like camps that are restarting or new camps, to be able to give not a lot of money, but just some money to help people start new camps. So you're not alone and you don't feel like you can start with nothing. It'll be, you know, like between three and five thousand dollars, depending how long your camp is and how many kids come. But also the foreseeable future is a found is a foundation with with uh, Griffin Pinkow, some of you know, and the foreseeable future actually is going to be giving grants out to new camps and they're going to make a priority to new camps. So between my grant that I get from the Gibney Foundation and foreseeable future, that's a good start to money to, to help your camp. So if you're worried about money, hopefully we'll be able to fund you. Unfortunately, I'm not going to find out about that until like January, but if you tell me you're definitely starting a camp, I'll put you on the list and I'll give you the application. Awesome. Thank you so much. Sure.